So let's get started. Uh, it's really such a pleasure to be able to welcome Kostis here to Alt as one of our keynote speakers. Kostis is a professor in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Um, he did his PhD at Berkeley and he has done amazing and beautiful work uh, in many different areas as he's sort of had phases of his career as he's come into and touched and um, made beautiful contributions to a number of areas. Um, so starting out with computational complexity of equilibria, game theory, uh, moved on and, and did some really nice work in auctions, uh, particularly multi-item auctions. Um, re more recently, he's been doing a lot of work um, that I would call learning theory and high dimensional statistics. Um, but you still see sort of themes from earlier in his career showing up in various ways in various places. Uh, today, he'll be talking with us about equilibrium computation and the foundations of deep learning. Um, Kostas has had uh, many, many awards, more than I can list over the course of his career, um, but including an Evelina pr Prize, um, the Kalai Prize from the Game Theory Society, the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award. Um, he's been recognized in many ways with many best paper awards and additional awards. Um, it's a, really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you so much, Katrina, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you both, uh, Katrina and Vitaly, for inviting me to, to ALT. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, as Katrina mentioned, I uh, have had interests uh, in various fields uh, over the years. And, and today, I'm going to talk about a topic in the intersection of uh, equilibrium computation and uh, machine learning. And uh, this is uh, most of the work I'm talking about today is joint work with uh, Stratis Koulakis uh, and Manolis Zambetakis, who was my PhD student and is now at uh, UC Berkeley. So a motivating question uh, for this uh, talk is uh, the following. How, how is it that uh, machine learning models uh, beat humans in very complex games like uh, poker and Go, uh, yet they cannot uh, play simpler games uh, that many of us can play decently well for example, uh, enter highways. So on the right, you see a Waymo car that, that's trying to enter a highway uh, and uh, is uh, antagonized by human uh, players, so much so that it abandons the attempt and uh, exits the highway and tries again. So how is it that uh, ML can solve this very complex games on the left and not uh, the other ones on the right? Uh, at a more high level, uh, and sort of like to connect it to the main topic of my talk, uh, deep learning has had uh, remarkable, impressive uh, progress uh, over the past decade. Uh, and a lot of that is due to uh, uh, f having very good optimizers of uh, very complex models, together, of course, with uh, data, uh, hardware, and, uh, you know, writing down the right models and the right objectives. But on the optimization side, uh, an empirical finding that has driven a lot of the progress in, the, in, in, in deep learning is that uh, in many uh, uh, learning settings, uh, gradient descent or its variants discover local minima, which generalize well. So the situation that we're facing though now and certainly uh, down the road is that uh, we're gonna have a lot of learning agents in the same environment uh, who are gonna be interacting with the environment, uh, so collecting data and rewards, but also with each other. So in particular, uh, their actions uh, and uh, you know, what they learned about the environment are gonna influence each other. And uh, unfortunately, in uh, this kind of scenario, it has been uh, known that uh, having those learning agents uh, optimize the, their learning and their actions using uh, simple procedures such as gradient descent is actually problematic. So gradient descent is very unstable in such environments, in such settings, multi-agent learning settings, uh, and uh, it, it oscillates or uh, converges to you know, very bad solutions. And what I wanna understand in this talk is how deep uh, this problem is, okay? And in fact, I'm only gonna be thinking about the baby version of this uh, question. And in particular, focus on mean max, so two agent, two agent fully competitive uh, uh, learning environments. Uh, so in particular, mean max problems. 
okay, which appear in uh, generative adversarial networks, other adversarial training applications, and uh, to agent reinforcement learning settings, and you know many other fully competitive to agent settings. Uh, in such applications uh, 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 in machine learning, uh, what you have is uh, that the variables are high dimensional, the optimization variables are high dimensional, and the function isn't convex. Okay, so you're outside of the von Neumann, the classical von Neumann uh, setting. And um, uh, because of the high dimensionality of X and Y, uh, and you know, the lack of any apparent uh, structure, what people try to do in this kind of settings is to run gradient descent for the minimizing player and gradient ascent for the maximizing player, or some variant of those, maybe playing with the learning rates, adding some other bells and whistles to the gradient descent dynamic, but this is uh, uh, an approach that people typically use in this kind of setting. The problem though is that uh, um, gradient descent doesn't work that great uh, uh, in min-max problems. And I'm sure you've all have seen uh, pictures like the ones uh, at the bottom showing how GANs fail to learn uh, the target distribution here on the left, uh, uh, cycling or converging to garbage uh, solutions along the training process. Okay, and it takes a lot of effort to fix uh, the gradient descent ascent dynamics in GAN training uh, if you can fix them at all. And um, you don't need to look so far to see uh, you know, some problems with gradient descent ascent. In fact, problems arise already in very trivial settings. So the simplest min-max problem where gradient descent also fails is min maximizing this trivial function x times y. So scalar times scalar, min max x times y. So for this uh, objective function, uh, the unique equilibrium is the zero, zero point, because otherwise one of the players can uh, uh, infinitely punish the other player. Uh, yet, uh, if you initialize uh, gradient descent ascent, which is shown here in the simplified uh, fun into the simple function, if you initialize it anywhere, what you're going to see uh, typically is this spiraling out behavior, and you can you can show that you know uh, varying the, the you know the learning rates and so on and so forth is not going to help you. And you know this cycling behavior is very robust to other bells and whistles you can add to gradient descent ascent. So, with this little introduction, uh, here's the here's the, the the question. So, you see training oscillations or garbage solutions even in two agent zero sum settings, let alone multi-agent scenarios, even when the function is convex concave, like this x times y function, which was convex concave, even when the function is low dimensional, even when the function is perfectly known to the optimizer. Uh, so uh, let, you know, so, you know, so, so good luck when the objective is non-convex concave, it's high dimensional and it's not fully known and you have to both learn it and train it, okay? Good, so, um, and um, this is what I wanna study in this talk from a computational uh, optimization standpoint. In particular, what I wanna compare is I wanna compare these two very paradigm paradigmatic problems on the left, minimizing a function f that is ellipsis and smooth. On the right, min maximizing a function that's ellipsis and smooth subject to some constraints that I'm gonna to take to be a convex and compact set. So I uh, already, already alluded to that uh, earlier, but uh, let me say it a bit uh, more in detail. Uh, the classical setting to study these two problems is to assume convexity on the left and convex concavity on the right. Okay, uh, if uh, you fall into these nice uh, settings, then we have a lot of theory about uh, what optimizers can uh, attain. And in fact, there's not too much difference between the left and the right in these benign settings. Uh, and uh, there is a formal, of course, as you all know, with the strong convex programming duality, there is a formal connection between the left and the right. But in any event, so as far as uh, first order methods are concerned, um, um, uh, in uh, uh, a number of steps that's polynomial in the relevant parameters of the problem. So the approximation, the smoothness of the function and the diameter of the set or the maximum, the, 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 diff, the, the F max minus F min or whatever, you can get uh, to a, a, a approximate global uh, optima of 
uh, uh, of your function uh, or, or min-max uh, 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 solution, studdles, uh, which, uh, you know, just, just to be clear, are, uh, you know, the definitions are shown here at the bottom. So on the left, you're looking for a point x star so that you cannot uh, change it to decrease the function by more than epsilon. On the right, you're looking for a point x star y star so that changing x star unilaterally cannot decrease the function by more than epsilon. Changing y star unilaterally I cannot increase the function by more than epsilon. So in particular, as you have already observed, I'm looking at simultaneous notions of equilibrium here. So there's no like, uh, I, I, like for the rest of my talk, I'm not going to care about the sequentiality of min and max or max and min. I'm going to be looking at uh, uh, equilibria, not sequen simultaneous equilibria rather than sequential equilibria. But you can similarly be think, think about uh, sequential solution. But in any event, so uh, uh, there's no real difference of the left and the right in this classical setting. Um, so uh, how do you consolidate then that with the oscillations of x times y that are showed in the very, uh, for the very simple function, the oscillations of gradient descent ascent for the function x times y. x times y is a convex cocaine function, but still we get these oscillations. Well, uh, the point of this slide is that if you get oscillations there, it's there is not uh, a result of some underlying complexity, uh, intractability of the problem. It's just a matter of not choosing the right uh, 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 gradient descent ascent uh, procedure. So, and we're going to dive a little bit into what is known to correct those oscillations. But the main uh, sort of focus of this talk is what happens in the modern setting. And in the modern setting, you drop convexity from the left, you drop convex concavity from the right. Of course, once uh, you drop convexity or convex concavity, the problem becomes very interactable, as my colleagues uh, you know, uh, in PCS would say. But sort of like the modern deep learning uh, perspective, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's okay, forget about uh, global optima, let's uh, shoot for a local optima. So what are local optima? Well, local optima uh, add this uh, modification to the definitions of, uh, of uh, optimality that I gave earlier. So uh, for minimization problems, uh, you want the next star so that no local uh, changes within a radius delta uh, to x star can decrease the function by more than epsilon. And similarly for the min-max problem, you only are looking for local unilateral deviations trying to decrease or increase the function depending on which player you're talking about. So uh, I guess my question is, okay, so now how, do the, how does the left and the right hand side uh, compare in this uh, modern uh, setting where I have dropped uh, convexity or convex concavity and I'm only assuming lipstance and smoothness? Uh, so, and to simplify my discussion, I'm going to normalize my function to zero one. So in this scenario, what we know is that the left-hand side is pretty good. So in fact, uh, as long as your delta, the, the radius within which you're looking for improvements is not too large as a function of epsilon and the smoothness, uh, first order methods uh, can still deliver you uh, uh, epsilon delta local minima uh, in a number of steps that's polynomial in one over epsilon and the smoothness of your function. For larger delta, existence of such solutions still holds. So you can prove that epsilon delta solution exists also for larger deltas. But if you make the delta large, the problem becomes a global optimization problem. Because of the lack of convexity, it becomes anti-hard. So you have to restrict your delta in order to uh, get tractability. On the right-hand side, maybe it's not as obvious, but you can show that um, equilibrium, like this type of epsilon delta local min-max equilibria still exists if you restrict, if you similarly restrict the radius within which you're looking for deviations. But the complexity of the problem is very unclear. And, and this is the main topic of this talk. But uh, so uh, my point here and coming back to the oscillations of gradient descent ascent is that uh, these training oscillations here could certainly be due also to computational intractability, uh, right? So unlike the convex concave case where uh, oscillations uh, uh, were the result of choosing the wrong method, but the problem was itself tractable, over here, 
maybe there's an inherent reason why you won't be able to get a method that converges at least in polynomial time uh, to local, even local min-max solutions if the problem is intractable. Okay, so this is what I want to investigate in this case. All right, so we got uh, we have the traditional setting where we want to we want to we want to see if we can remove the oscillations, and there is hope there because the problem is not intractable. And there is this modern setting where uh, uh, we didn't have no idea about the complexity of the problem. So, uh, you know, before sort of like trying to get a method that uh, does not oscillate, uh, we, we have to understand the complexity of the problem. So I want to achieve these two goals in this lecture. And so I guess so the plan is, uh, yeah, to first dive into the convex concave case and then talk about the non-convex non-concave case. So my, my, my uh, uh, convex concave treatment is gonna be very short because I wanna focus more on the non-convex non-concave case. All right, so let's dive into the convex concave case. And uh, I wanna remind you this picture of uh, min maximizing X times Y using gradient descent ascent. So if you initialize here and the equilibrium is here, you get very typically the cycling behavior. So what I want to understand is what, what's going on? Well, what's the issue uh, with GDA convergence? Why does it oscillate? Uh, the reason it oscillates is that uh, GDA, uh, as you uh, may well know, is an example of uh, FTRL, follow the regularized leader, with uh, L2 squared regularization in particular. And what we know about no regret learning in zero-sum games is that they, uh, it, it, it does converge, but it converges in an average kind of sense. So no regret learning in zero sum games converges, except it converges only in the average. So the average of these uh, trajectories is actually converging to the target, but the last iterate is actually going to outer space. So this is the typical behavior of no regret learning in zero sum games. And we have a question in the chat, if I can oh, pause oh, you. You are yeah, going yeah. asks, uh, what happens for finite games? The domains of X and Y are finite. Uh, still, yeah, you, this is uh, robust. So you get, you, you get the oscillations, except you, you're blocked by the boundary, but uh, that, yeah, that's the only difference. You don't go to outer space, but you are going to be going around the boundary. Or at least you can construct games is what I mean, where this happens, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this type of uh, convergence is similar to the convergence of the moon to the earth. So the moon is going around the earth, but it does not hit the earth. So it goes around the earth. The average of the trajectory of the moon is the earth, but um, not the last iterate, luckily. So, but, you know, in this lecture, we want to get the moon to hit the earth. Okay, so uh, how can we get, do that? Well, let's focus on, on what's happening here. So you, you get the, <clears throat> so the moon is going around the, the earth. In fact, the moon here in this picture is actually going to outer space. What does that mean? That means that the momentum of the GDA dynamics is wrong. It's pushing, the, it's pushing the, our particle uh, you know, away from the target. So we would like to correct that momentum, uh, right? So, um, uh, so the moment the momentum is pushing it further and further out from the target. So one way to correct the momentum uh, uh, is uh, a classical method due to Popov. So a few years ago, uh, uh, with uh, uh, some collaborators, we, we proposed going back to those methods and try to analyze their convergence to 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 the equilibrium. So one uh, method that corrects the momentum is uh, what is called optimistic gradient descent as ascent. And, and what that does is in every step of the gradient descent ascent, it actually undoes, it undoes the effect of the gradient that was added yesterday. So for the gradient descent player, it adds uh, with half the learning rate yesterday's gradient. And for the minimizing, maximizing player, it, it removes uh, uh, half, with half the learning rate. Uh, uh, yesterday's uh, gradient with respect to y. And so like pictorially, what that does is, you, you know, like if this would be the gradient descent ascent step, what uh, the correction does is it takes yesterday's push and adds half of its negative to the current push. So ultimately what that does is it gets the, uh, you know, our particle to the target. 
Okay, that is that is what uh, uh, this optimistic gradient descent ascent procedure uh, does. So it, it gets the it gets the moon to 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 the Earth. Okay, so that, that, that is a joke, but yeah. Uh, somebody retweeting something that I wrote about that. Okay. Um, all right. So as I said, this optimistic gradient descent ascent method is a classical method due to Popov, and there is a related method due to Korpelevitz that called uh, extra gradient, which uh, you know some of you I'm sure have heard about. And what was known in the literature is that these two methods uh, exhibit asymptotic convergence to mean much equilibria, but last iterate asymptotic last iterate convergence to min max equilibria and uh, sort of like you know more recent work has also tried to go a little bit outside the range of convex concave functions uh, to, to still argue that asymptotic convergence holds uh, over the recent years we have seen a lot of work trying to understand the rates at which uh, convergence to, to, to equilibrium uh, takes place uh, if you're interested in the last iterate uh, sense of convergence. And um, the rough uh, picture is that we have a very good understanding of the rates in the unconstrained setting. But back to the question that was in the chat earlier, we actually don't know uh, uh, very well the rates uh, for constrained settings. And in particular, we haven't yet replicated the rates that average rate convergence uh, shows in that setting. So, um, um, so in the unconstrained setting, there is there is a gap between uh, last iterate rates and uh, average iterate. Average is faster, probably, than last iterate, but the gap is polynomial between the two rates. But in the constrained setting, the gaps can be, you know, as far as we know. I mean, I don't believe that, but we have not yet established that last iterate uh, 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 is, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, polynomial in the dimension, for example, of, of the problem. So we, we you know, the, that is pretty wide open uh, there. So yeah, so um, uh, that, that is a very interesting question if you're looking for open problems to think about. So in the convex concave setting, which is a nice setting, try to argue that one of these two methods or some related method with negative momentum maybe has fast last iterate convergence rates in the constraint setting. Um, yeah, uh, that is a brief sort of like overview of what we know in the convex concave setting, where again, it's a matter of choosing the right method and not a matter of an underlying interactability. But the main open question, which is widely open, is uh, uh, what happens in the non-concave, non-convex, non-concave case, which is what I want to study next. Good, so without further ado, let me actually try to address that. So as you remember, I'm, I'm trying to make a comparison between uh, these two problems in the, um, um, in the modern setting where our function is Lipschitz but not convex or convex on cave. I'm looking for this uh, local uh, optima or local min max equilibria. And as I pointed out earlier, if the locality is small enough so that your problem is not a global optimization problem, but really a local optimization problem, <clears throat> on the left, you can get uh, fir first order methods to converge in polynomial number of steps and queries to your function and the gradient. We have another um, question, if I can interrupt oh, you. Sorry. Yeah, yes, please. Um, Pratish Kamath asks, is it clear that a pure equilibrium exists in the non-convex, non-concave setting? Right, so uh, a pure equilibrium, like a global min max, no. But uh, as I as I point point out uh, here in this uh, thing that I didn't, uh, admittedly did not spend too much time on, uh, if your locality is small enough, you can prove that there is there exists a, a local min max equilibrium. But it's a non-trivial statement. Uh, the existence of a local uh, um, uh, like uh, epsilon delta local minimum on the left for any delta is actually pretty simple to show. Uh, it basically boils down to the existence of uh, a minimum uh, of, a, of a function that's continuous um, uh, in, a, in a convex compact set. On the right is not as trivial. So it, it takes some work, but you can argue that if your locality is uh, <clears throat> small enough, uh, these things exist. 
Yeah, but th that's a great question. That's the first worry that you may have <laughs> uh, when, when, when looking at the problem on the right. Like, am I, am I trying to find something that doesn't exist? That's a big problem, right? If you're in this problem, if you, if, if you have that problem uh, uh, on the outset, at the outset, then chances are your problem is NP hard. So good luck with that. But uh, we don't have this problem here. The, the, this thing does exist. So the question is though, uh, how hard is it to find it? Uh, and uh, the theorem that I wanted to talk about is that uh, first order methods uh, uh, will need a number of queries to the function and the gradient that is exponential in epsilon, uh, the, the, the smoothness and the dimension to find such solutions. So there is a intractability result there for first order methods. So that's, that, that, that is what we, we, we show. And um, in fact, uh, it's a bit, uh, so, and, and this is an unconditional result. So like uh, no matter what, you know, if you have black box access to F and its gradient, it will take an exponential number of steps to find such points. And it's a bit, uh, life is a bit uh, tougher. Uh, 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 so the problem, even if you have white box access to F, so you can look at the, you know, what F is, um, uh, finding such solutions is uh, hard in a complexity theoretic sense. So it is PPD complete, and I will get into what that means in a little bit. But what that means is that uh, unless you believe that uh, two complexity classes P and PPD collapse, uh, which we don't, you know, many of us don't expect to happen, any algorithm, first order, second, mom, second order, or whatever, will have to take super polynomial number of steps to find such points. So and that was, back, yeah. Sorry, that, that was exponential number of queries, exponential uh, time. Sorry, I missed the, the statement. In, in uh, uh, so the previous slide, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. So it's, uh, it's the same. So both. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. queries. So think of them as queries. So yeah, yeah. exponential number of queries. Thanks. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that is in the unconditional result, has nothing to do with complexity theory. But uh, unfortunately, we don't know how to prove such a result without going to complexity theory. So that's an interesting feature of the theorem. Like, I, I don't know how to prove this theorem here without first proving a PPD completeness result and uh, uh, turning the white box axis to black box axis to get an unconditional result. So that, like, for those of you interested in optimization, that's an interesting feature of the proof. We had to go through uh, complexity uh, theory of uh, the class PPD to get this uh, uh, conditional uh, lower bound uh, to then turn the white box access to F and gra uh, grad F into black box access, so query access, to then get an exponential lower bound. This is the, the way we prove the result. Okay. Right, so the, in the balance, um, yeah, so uh, if you believe P is different than PPAD, um, uh, any algorithm uh, will take super polynomial number of steps, even if it has white box access to F and its gradient. So it can look at the subroutine computing F and grab F. But if you don't like complexity theory, uh, you know, stick with first order methods, you get an exponential lower bound. All right, so, and, you know, I guess I'm not expecting you to know what PPAD is, so let me show it in the, in, in the realm of classes you may recognize. So it stands between P and NP, okay? So it's not as hard as, uh, uh, it does not, you know, we, we presume, it does not contain the traveling salesman, salesman, salesman problem, uh, but we uh, believe it's harder than uh, uh, P which contains linear programming. And in particular, PPAD uh, is a class that is exactly capturing the complexity of finding fixed points of Lipschitz functions, uh, Nash equilibria in uh, general sum, general sum uh, uh, normal form games, and many other uh, problems in topology uh, that are total. They always, ha they always have a solution uh, uh, and that the existence is guaranteed by some fixed point argument. So in other words, what that result says is that finding local min-max equilibria in this non-convex, uh, non-concave uh, setting uh, is exactly as hard as finding rare fixed point of Lipschitz functions, uh, computing equilibria in normal, in general sum games, 
and at least as hard as any problem in this class. That's what the PPD completeness result means. And now again, as I said, we can extract from that complexity result a non-conditional result by turning uh, the white box access to the function and the gradient into a black box one, okay? So now I wanted to give a little bit of a flavor of how you prove such a thing, how and why you have to appeal to this uh, complexity of fixed points to do so. But before I do so, and um, uh, I'm gonna admittedly only sketch uh, the ideas, uh, I wanna uh, first uh, uh, give some intuition about why is minimization different than min-max? And to give some intuition about that, what I want you to think about is uh, I'm gonna compare two uh, settings. I'm, I'm gonna compare a cooperative game where two players are trying to both minimize uh, a function. So it's a min-min game. And I wanna compare uh, that to a min-max game where people have opposing, exactly opposing objectives like I have been talking about so far. And uh, I wanna consider uh, best response dynamics in uh, these types, these two classes of games. So min-min and min-max. So on the left, I'm showing you uh, 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 potential values for the objective function along a big uh, uh, best response dynamic path when one of the players moves along the horizontal axis and the other player moves, has actions moving along the, the, the vertical axis. So because this is a min-min game, uh, and you know, along the best response dynamics, both players should improve the common, the shared objective. So you have to have values that are uh, 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 decreasing as you go along the path. And in particular, over a long best response dynamic path on the left, uh, the function value along that path reveals the location where you are along this path. Uh, and in particular, since the function value is decreasing as you go, if there is a bound to how much your value can decrease, uh, you're making steps towards the goal, the, you know, finding a local optimum as you're moving along this best response path on the left. On the right, where you have the min player moving along the horizontal and the max moving along the vertical axis, you can see patterns like this along best response dynamics paths. Like uh, over here, the function value goes from three to one, right? So, because it's a best response by the min player. Now the function value, now the max player pushes down and increases the function value. Then the other guy decreases, increases, decreases, increasing. But you can get this very long best response dynamics paths where looking at the function value somewhere along this path reveals no information about where you are in this path. So in this case, you have no memory. And in fact, you can also have cycles which you cannot get over here. So over here on the min min case, you cannot get cycles. But in the min max case, you can get even cycles of like the best response paths can cycle. So this seems a bit uh, harder, right? Because uh, querying the function value doesn't give you any info about where the uh, solution should be. Right? It's, you have no memory, right? So that's the intuition you wanna, you wanna, you wanna write on. So to prove uh, exponential lower bounds, what you'd like is you would like to take a huge such path, like maybe a space uh, filling uh, you know, path uh, and hide it in some ambient space uh, and argue that sort of like, you know, like you gain no info by querying the function at uh, uh, various places in this ambient space. And you have to do kind of some kind of exhaustive search to find the min max solution. This is what you would like to do. Unfortunately, and this is where the proof gets hard. I don't know how to do that uh, without appealing to topology. So I don't know how to take something like this, make it uh, like a space filling, you know, like snake, right? And, 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 and embed it into some ambient space and uh, define the function value also in the ambient space without creating spurious uh, local saddles everywhere. So I don't know how to do that. The only way I know how to do that is to use uh, uh, topology, okay? And I wanna give you a tiny flavor of how this is done, but uh, you know, if, I, if what I talk about doesn't make too much sense, uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's not your fault, it's my fault. I, I'm gonna try to, to, to just give a flavor, but not all the details, okay? 
Uh, and in particular, I'm going to start with a, a problem that is PPD complete. This is a, a problem that you might have seen or maybe not. Sorry, um, I just noticed uh, another question oh, in the chat. I apologize. Yeah. I was wasn't watching carefully. Uh, Lionel yeah. is asking, can't the min-max dilemma give us info about where we refused to go? I'm not quite uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't understand Sorry. The, yeah. No, I can't quite yeah. parse the question. Lionel, Lionel, do you want to unmute yourself and just ask it? Sorry, try speaking again. It's almost about. Sorry, your audio got cut off from my perspective. Same here. Lionel, do you want to just try typing your question again, maybe with a bit more detail? Sorry, I couldn't quite parse it. Oh, he's okay. Maybe we'll come back to it at the end. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry let's, for the let's interruption. Do it. Yeah, let's do it later. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I wanna I wanna give you some intuition about uh, you know how to um, embed this uh, minmax snake inside MBM space, and uh, I'm gonna appeal to um, uh, uh, something rela very closely related to Brouwer's Fixman theorem, uh, and in particular another theorem that's called Sperner's lemma. So Sperner's lemma says uh, it has versions in uh, multiple dimensions. I'm gonna show it in 2D. So it says the following. So imagine you have a grid, triangulated grid. And you color it with three colors, uh, but you respect this boundary coloring that I'm showing you here. So you have to, you know, the boundary is fixed to this coloring, but you can color the internal vertices no, whatever way you want. Uh, the claim is that no matter what you did, there must be a trichromatic triangle. And in fact, there always has to be an odd number of such triangles. And if you pay attention to the picture here, you'll see that there is a five, five trichromatic triangles. Now, how do you prove the theorem? Okay, so you want to prove that there must be a trichromatic triangle. So how do you prove that? Well, you add an artificial uh, uh, node here uh, at the bottom left so that you create your own artificial trichromatic triangle. This is not, this is a fake triangle. This is not, you, you created it, okay? But you capitalize on the fact that the boundary is fixed to this coloring. So you know that there is a, you can create a triangle over here. So you declare that triangle, the starting point of a walk you're gonna do in this grid. And what your walk is gonna do is it's gonna cross red, yellow doors, keeping red on your right hand side. So you cross the door and you enter into a new triangle, which again happens to have, I mean, a color, uh, uh, another red, yellow door. So you cross that, right? And now you query and say, oh, what is this color? If it is blue, you're done because you enter through this triangle through a red yellow door. If it's blue, you've, you've got your trichromatic triangle. If it's not, then another red yellow door will open up for you that you can cross having red on your right. So in this case, it's yellow, which opens up this door I can cross. So I go into this triangle, the triangle has a red yellow door, I cross it, now I query this color. It's red, I cross this door, I query this point, it's red, across the door, across the door, across the door. Now I ask the color is yellow, across the door. I always keep, uh, I'm crossing red, yellow doors, having red on my right. It's a red, I cross the door, it's a yellow and so on and so forth. And I hit a trichromatic triangle, why? Well, because I cannot exit this uh, grid. There is no red, yellow door on the boundary that I can cross. Right after I added my tri artificial triangle over here, that I, you know, I blocked all doors. You cannot escape this grid. The only stopping condition is you enter into a triangle through a red yellow door and you encounter a blue. Otherwise another door will open up for you. So the only case you won't stop is if you create a row shape, like sort of like you wander a little bit and then you close a loop and then you go around the loop forever. But row shapes cannot happen because at the junction of the row, you need a triangle with three red yellow doors and you cannot get a triangle with three red yellow doors. Every triangle has at most two red yellow doors. So the only stopping condition is to cross into a, to a triangle and find a blue. And because nothing else can happen, you cannot exit, you cannot get into a row shape, you have to stop. So there must be a trichromatic triangle. So I proved the first part of the lemma. 
And you can also prove the second part as follows. Uh, I'm not gonna let's. I'm not gonna pay too much attention, but I'm gonna give the rough idea. Well, I'm now, I now revealed all the other colors uh, that, I, that I was hiding before. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a. I'm gonna put an edge between two neighboring triangles. If they share a red yellow edge that you can cross to go from one triangle A to the other triangle B having red on your right. So if you do that, if you define this uh, neighborhood, like this uh, directed edges between triangles, you basically will cover your whole grid with uh, paths, uh, cycles. So single cycles are not a problem. Rows are a problem, right? So single cycles are not a problem. Isolated nodes. So these no, these, these triangles have no neighbors. They, they don't share any red yellow doors with any neighbors. So these are isolated triangles. Uh, this is my you know, path that I showed you earlier. There's a cycle that, and there's some other paths. And you can see that sort of like all endpoints of paths are trichromatic triangles because the only way I can have only incoming but not outgoing or only outgoing and not incoming, I must be trichromatic. And this parity, the fact that you have a bunch of paths and cycles and isolated vertices and all endpoints of paths are trichromatic gives you the odd number of triangles, right? Because this one was artificial. That's why, so there's an even, but this one is artificial, so there's an odd number. Okay, so that's a rough sketch of uh, what's going on here. Now, using Sperner, you can prove Brouwer, and using Brouwer, you can prove Nash theorem, and basically all these problems are PPD complete. Uh, uh, in particular, Papadimitri, who defined PPD, and uh, later Chen and Deng in two dimensions, showed that if uh, I, if the coloring of the vertices is computed by a circuit to which you have white box access, finding trichromatic triangles is a PPD complete problem. It's a hard problem to find trichromatic triangles if I give you a circuit that you can query to get access to the colors in this grid. All right, so that is Sperner's lemma and it's PPD complete. So now what I wanna do is I wanna, Capital, capitalize on the structure that is created here to create my min max problem, right? So, and I hope that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, like I'm gonna start with a Sperner instance that has a very long, very long path, right? That is snaking through the space, right? But what's important is that, you know, I get also the structure that is implied by the rest of, of the colors, right? Uh, um, so, and, and what we do is roughly, roughly, roughly speaking, so to reduce uh, a Sperner instance to our problem is what we do is the following. We basically double the dimensions and we have one of the two players of our game choose a triangle. So we have the max player choose a triangle. We have the min player choose an edge of that triangle and uh, we decide on the, func on the function value for a selection of a triangle and an edge based on uh, whether uh, um, um, the triangle player chose a triangle that has a red yellow door edge and, and whether uh, the uh, edge player chose a, a red yellow edge in that triangle with the right orientation. So this is roughly speaking what's going on. And the goal from that construction is that the best response dynamics that will arise from our min max problem are going to simulate these long paths of the Sperner instance. And we're going to start, as I said, with the Sperner instance that has very long paths. So we will uh, 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 make, make sure that this best response dynamics will take forever to settle. And let me show you how, roughly speaking, is this done. So if uh, the, you know, the uh, triangle player chooses this triangle and the, and the, and the um, edge player chooses that edge, we're gonna take the function value to plus one and give an incentive to the edge player to switch to the other red yellow edge of the, of the, of the triangle to make the function minus one. Then we're gonna, we, we're gonna give an incentive to the triangle player to pivot to the neighboring triangle sharing that red yellow edge to turn the value to plus one. Then we're gonna give an incentive to the edge player to pivot to make the function minus one. And we're gonna 
by, by flipping from plus minus one, like the function, like giving incentive either to the edge or the triangle player, we can basically uh, simulate in our best response uh, uh, dynamics the uh, going through that path that I showed you earlier. Right? This is what we want to do. And uh, we want to arrive at a situation of the trichromatic triangle where uh, 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 the edge player cannot move because they cannot flip the red edge to, to, to decrease the function value. And we want to settle uh, into a local equilibrium that is identified uh, with a, 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 a trichromatic triangle. So that's what we want to do. And, you know, life is difficult, of course. I mean, it's not going to work like this because uh, you have to also define the function value outside, like in a non uh, uh, in a triangle that doesn't have red yellow edges so that you don't create spurious min max solutions all over the place. So that is something we need to take care of. Uh, which was the problem we you know, started with, right? Like uh, when I gave you intuition about how min min is different from min max, I told you that, you know, I would like to take a snake and hide it into ambient space so that I don't create spurious local min max everywhere. And the only min maxes are at the ends of these long paths. Uh, uh, so I haven't really told you how to address this problem either, but, but I hope I have convinced you that because there is some topological uh, structure here, maybe I can accomplish that. And this is you know, something you have to take care of. The other thing that you have to take care of, which is not topological, but we had some issue actually doing is, you know, so far I talked about plus minus ones, but you know, we have a continuous problem at hand and uh, Trying to go through this uh, complexity uh, reduction, we have to arrive at a function that is Lipschitz and smooth. So, and um, uh, 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 interpolating a function in high dimensions so that is Lipschitz and smooth was not trivial uh, to do computationally efficiently. So, so, right, what happens in the end of our reduction is that we have defined a function values and the gradient values at all points of a high dimensional grid, so in D dimensions. And we want to interpolate in the rest of the space so that the resulting function is ellipsis and smooth. And we want to do that efficiently. So we don't want to pay two to the dimension, but we want to pay polynomial in the dimension for that interpolation. That was not an easy task for us. So that was a little technical Thing that has nothing to do with topology per se or the rest of our reduction, but it was a technical difficulty. This is a, a very brief tour through the proof, but I hope some of the main ideas were uh, hammered. So, but you know, to conclude, this is this is what we show. We show that the problem is difficult, which brings me to sort of like uh, uh, concluding uh, my, my my talk. Uh, and be before I conclude, I want to make a philosophical corollary, which is this, uh, coming back to where I started. So I said that single agent deep learning was based on gradient descent. I claim that multi-agent deep learning, and again, this is my opinion, debatable, happy to talk about it more <laughs> in the break, but I claim that we cannot base uh, multi-agent deep learning on the same paradigm. We cannot just write down some model for our learning agents, give them access to data and supercomputers and ask each of them to run their copy of gradient descent. That's just not gonna settle even if you have two agents who are fully competitive. Instead, what I want to argue is that you need a lot more work in modeling your setting in hand, understanding what is the right inductive bias to endow your agent with? Uh, what is the right uh, solution concept you should be shooting for? Is that local min-max equilibrium? Is it something more cooperative? Some, you know, should you have some correlation of behavior among the agents? What is the right solution concept to be targeting? Should you be looking at dynamical behavior rather than equilibrium behavior? And uh, after uh, you get th those insights, you can start thinking about what optimization methods uh, uh, to define so that you compute the, the right solution concept you, you, you wanted to. And I claim that only if we do this kind of approach, we will get more successes like the AlphaGo or the, or the, or the Texas Hold'em advances. 
uh, which incidentally are not just gradient descent. So, so what's happening inside in the guts of the AlphaGo method is using some understanding of uh, how to solve uh, turn-based uh, zero-sum games of complete information. So in the guts of the AlphaGo algorithm, there is Monte Carlo three search. In the guts of the Texas Hold'em method, the, Libra, the Libratus method, uh, there is a counterfactual regret minimization. So we use a lot more than just, uh, you know, blindfolded gradient descent of our models, okay? So I want to argue about this uh, way to proceed in the multi-agent world. So to summarize, min-max optimization, equilibrium computation, of course, uh, uh, are very fundamental uh, in mathematics, game theory, and, and, and several other fields. But applications of them in, in machine learning pose big challenges due to the high dimensionality of the problems and the non-convexity of the resulting problems. And I expect these applications to uh, explode and there's a lot of work to do. So, so you know, like, so, uh, this is a call to arms. Uh, uh, this, this lecture is supposed to be a call to arms uh, thinking about these problems. So what I showed today is some intractability results uh, and some Oracle lower bounds for finding uh, min-max, local min-max solutions. And uh, uh, a wide open challenge uh, is uh, uh, in min-max or beyond in equilibrium computation problems, multi-agent learning settings to find gradient-based or other lightweight methods that compute equilibria, okay? And even the baby challenge that I talked about in this uh, talk is open. Uh, so some ongoing work that I want to highlight with students and collaborators uh, that we're doing along these lines. But, but again, this is a vast area that is wide open. So the, 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 there is a ton of problems to be thinking about. So one thing we do in some ongoing work is to try to find asymptotically convergent methods in non-convex, non-concave settings. Of course, as a uh, polynomial time methods are precluded by these results in general. So we want to find asymptotically converging methods or uh, uh, look at problems with enough structure that sidestep the complexity results. And that's also uh, 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 offers a lot of opportunities, that, that perspective. So understand what in your setting allows you to bypass the intractability result. And you know, the AlphaGo guys and the Texas Hold'em people uh, uh, where uh, that's what they did. So they identified problems where interactability results could be sidestepped. Uh, so, you know, some recent work is looking at two agent, zero sum reinforcement learning problems where uh, you lose convex concavity, but nevertheless, you have enough structure to have the min max theorem. So min max equals max min in this setting. So which uh, uh, means that there is a lot of structure in there. So we exploit this structure in this work to have gradient send, ascent procedures that converge. In this other uh, more recent work, we look at uh, more kind of like abstract uh, settings where we show that you can go a little bit beyond convex concavity and still have a convergence to global solutions. These are some recent uh, results and, and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to, to get any questions uh, there may be, thank you. Great, thanks so much. So I don't know, can you see the chat now or would you like me to read off questions from the chat? Uh, I think, hang on a second. Uh, yes, I, think I can open it. Okay, so where do I start? Uh, let's see. This is the last question is just popped up. Okay. Yeah, so the question is about so are there kind of like, uh, can, I, can I mix maybe convex and uh, non-convex and, and maybe get some mileage out of it? Um, you can. So the easiest case is when the out, like you're looking at a sequential problem, min max, in, uh, not, not uh, instantaneous, but the sequential version, like min plays first, max follows. And when the inner player is facing a nice problem. So if you have like a, a, a min max problem where uh, you're non-convex with respect to the main player, but you are concave with respect to the inner player, the problem is much, much, much better behaved because effectively 
the inner problem you can solve, you know, like you can do a, a ton of gradient this ascent steps and solve it, or you can you can have a, a multi-scale version where the, the max player goes faster than the mean. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, you can, you can compute local min-max solutions of, of different forms in, in that setting. Uh, so, um, right, so the, yeah, that, that is one comment there. I'm not sure what happens in the simultaneous version. My, my guess is that if you're looking at a like non-convex concave problem, uh, simultaneous, my guess is that it's still PPD complete, but I have to think about it. Okay, so, but that's my guess. So the sequential though is uh, better behaved. Thanks. This was a really, I think, exciting talk. I really appreciated the, the call to arms. Um, do you have advice for a grad student who's coming from machine learning theory and is a bit daunted by all this PPAD, uh, you know, Shapley, Nash, what is all of this stuff? What do they actually need to know from that world in order to sort of embrace your vision here? Uh, so I think that, uh, yeah, so like if, if they're looking for, I mean, I guess, you know, like, yeah, so, so, so the question, I guess, more broadly goes back to this philosophical kind of like perspective there, which does imply that you need to know a little bit of game theory. Like how can you think of multi-agent learning where uh, agents have different objectives if you don't understand uh, some basic concepts of game theory? So I think, I feel like progress in the multi-agent front will have to embrace uh, some of the ideas of uh, game theory and you know, like the, the solution concepts that people have been thinking about for several decades. So you can't just do machine learning. So, and this is my point really, like you cannot just do machine learning uh, without knowing anything about that. You have to pay some, but you know, I'm not expecting that you need to know PIPAT completeness or anything like that to uh, uh, start working on defining the right solution concepts and defining optimization procedures that uh, achieve those concepts. So. You know, this intractability results can be somewhere in the background, but, uh, you know, as I was arguing uh, here, uh, uh, you know, maybe your problem has some extra structure that uh, allows you to uh, find equilibria. So what is that structure? That is the important thing that one has to answer. Like, what is the nice structure in your problem? To avoid this worst case, admittedly, worst case uh, intractability results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some domain knowledge, I think, like my point is that some domain knowledge has to be used, embraced. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is just off the top of my head, but is there is there any way to sort of uh, connect between a uh, recent work that has focused a, focused a lot on adaptivity and the role of adaptivity and this sort of competitive uh, interaction that that you're talking about? Um, so, so we have this theme that's emerged looking at sort of the harms from adaptivity or sort of how we, how do we think about adaptivity and adaptively chosen computations? Is there any way to make a connection there? I think, I think, yeah, I mean, like, of course, adaptivity is a broad topic and it has many, uh, uh, you know, settings and, and applications, but, but yeah, like certainly like, uh, there are very tight connections, for example, you know, like. One type of min-max problem is, uh, you know, when you have adversarial examples where sort of like, you know, like the examples adapt to you, right? And you want yeah. to be robust to that potential. Uh, so there is, uh, and you know, like a lot of, I think data shift problems can be viewed through the lens of, of game theory. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, assuming that your adversary is not uh, Byzantine, but uh, they are uh, uh, strategic. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, this is one, like, of course, you know, like, I get also like, uh, uh, you know, like no regret learning, right? Uh, that, that's a very deep connection. Like no regret learning is adapting to a, to a worst case environment. Uh, and, you know, right, uh, like off the shelf, if you combine two no regret learning algorithms, you convert to uh, uh, equilibrium, different types, like uh, in zero sum games, min max, uh, in uh, general sum games correlated. So adaptivity automatically many times implies convergence to equilibrium, but sometimes uh, you can do better, you can do faster rates uh, 
uh, if you don't, if you model, like if you don't model the uh, world uh, as a Byzantine, as, as being uh, adversarial, but you model it as strategic. So oftentimes uh, a strategic player against a strategic player converts faster to equilibrium than a strategic player who doesn't model the opponent and, and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah, uh, so, and so in that sense, this, this line of this direction that you're talking about also has natural connections to sort of people thinking about robustness and and I mean there are many many natural. That's right. That's people. right. Yeah, great. Other questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves, by the way, if you'd like to just ask a question. All right. Well, actually, were you going to ask something? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just I uh, still I'm still trying to better formulate the question. But uh, the high level, thanks for all for a wonderful talk. Uh, the I'm still trying to understand what are sort of the applications, uh, modern applications where one gets into these problems, these multi-agent problems. For example, you mentioned the, the examples of self-driving cars, and I, but I don't quite see how that would even fit into this framework simply because, I mean, we already have established rules by which uh, humans uh, drive and, and, and sort of the, the goal is for computers to kind of optimize how they fit into that environment. We are not quite uh, in the setting where it's just self-driving cars against each, uh, each other. Um, and maybe, okay, with the games, it's probably somewhat different because, okay, okay maybe you can imagine that both computers playing against each other and not just, um, uh, humans. So, yeah, what are the uh, what are the examples sort of from the modern applications where you see uh, these issues crop up? And uh... yeah, so I guess you know, like starting from GANs uh, and uh, you yeah, know, GANs, yeah, right, training, right. Uh, mm -hmm. which are already modeled as such. Uh, the richer uh, area where you, the richest area, I think, where you will encounter such things is multi-agent reinforcement learning environments. Uh, for example, you know, like uh, coordinating a fleet of robots or a fleet of cars. Uh, but but, but uh, just to come back to my original slide where like the car is trying to enter the highway. So that decision, uh, so whether to kind of like aggressively try to change lanes is a game theoretic decision because you have to understand, you have to model your opponents and understand whether, you know, like you can credibly threat to go in front of them uh, 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 you know, in anticipation that they will uh, break. So that is a game theoretic setting. It's not just uh, uh, adhering to the rules of uh, 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 driving, but it's, it's modeling your opponent and making a decision in anticipation of what they will do. So it is a game theoretic scenario there. Uh, and, but, but yeah, like, uh, as you may imagine, like, you know, like fleets of cars, fleets of robots, uh, you know, are very rich applications. And, so like at the more technical uh, level, I think uh, the, one of the primary areas that I think are very interesting is uh, reinforcement learning problems where you have more than one agent uh, uh, taking actions. So multi-agent RL is a very general and very interesting uh, uh, like place to find such applications. Probably more so in the competitive setting, right? Because again, for something like a fleet, you would imagine some them having a shared goal and as you mentioned these these types of problems are are somewhat easier when the objective is uh, is uh, yeah so so competitive uh, the challenges there have to do with communication like how much you can coordinate all your fleet or or, or agents must make actions independently like uh, uh, you know like uh, like you know like species are such a like an evolutionary game theory species are you know competitive but uh, they cannot coordinate uh, that much. Like uh, species want to optimize the livelihood of the species, but like in a very uncoordinated way and game theoretic uh, issues arise there. So uh, yeah, for fleet of cars, communication is a big uh, question. How much you can coordinate the behavior of your cars or not? Mm -hmm. Like when you go okay. to like a nuclear disaster area with your robots, how much uh, communication they can... Uh, use uh, to coordinate their actions and stuff like that. Yeah. So we are, we are over time, but there's one more question in the chat, if you don't mind. It's a, somebody asking for sort of guidance where to start, maybe first papers to read or talks to watch or books to look at. Uh, any, 
Yeah, so I guess it depends on the keyword, but uh, like, for example, if you if you care about the hardcore kind of like complexity results, just, you, you know, you can dive into our paper and, and follow, you know, like links from, from there. But like, if you don't care about the complexity aspect, but only the last iterate sort of like things, then you can, uh, you don't need to understand all that. You can just directly uh, look at them, you know, some of the more recent references. I can share my slides uh, or something and you can follow links from there. But again, there are many disconnected components and you don't need to understand the whole, the totality uh, to, yeah, to dive into one or, or the other aspect. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So for optimistic, you can just read, you know, like uh, one of the, yeah, recent papers. Thank you. Yeah. So everybody, let's thank Kostis again for this great thank talk. Thank you. Thank you. And the next session is beginning actually in two minutes. Um, so please dash back to room A for lots of bandits. See you guys there. Thanks, Kostis. This is great. Yeah, thank you, everybody.